So uh, thanks for organizing this wonderful event and inviting me to relate to Vivian's book. Uh, this is a very rich and subtle book and has many, many jewels that evolve, as Alida said and Steve said, on a very careful textual analysis. Um, and there's so many things to, so many threads to pick and discuss. I want to talk about what I consider the heart of the book. Maybe I'm wrong in it. Uh, and its contribution to modern Jewish thought. It is a book to a certain degree contributing to the ongoing development, conversation of modern Jewish thought. It is as well, and here maybe I differ a little bit from Steve, an apologia, not in the bad sense, I mean not in the worst sense, not in the apologetic sense, but it is an apologia. And I want to explain the terms of the apologia here and the terms of the debate. Uh, here I'm just picking a thread because there are many, many threads in this book. And the, one, the thing I want to relate to is the resurgence of the Christian Jewish polemics uh, with the emergence of Paul, re-emergence of Paul. And it takes an old supersessionist form that is very known, which is Christianity superseded Judaism in two ways. It superseded the law and changed it with love the old god of law, the harsh god of judgment, is now replaced and superseded by love. And it's also superseding particularism with universal appeal. There is no slave and master, no women, no, no man, no Gentile, no Jew. There is an, uh, Judaism is particular and Christianity is universal. These are all tropes. We know them in so many permutations. I mean, it begins, it begins at the moment, actually, when Paul is beginning, beginning to be interpreted. So we know that. There is nothing, to a certain degree, new in there. But, and here's, I think, something very fascinating about the book. This theme come again to the discussion with a new urgency and kind of a new fascinating twist that I think Vivian both confronts, unmasks, and tackles in a very deep way. This is why I think I read it as a major, among many other things, as a major contribution to this debate. In what way? And I'm talking now about two figures here that are central to this term, Agamben and Badil. But it, it's true about Lyotard and others, etc. Agamben plays a major role. It's a sort of almost the other of this book. All intertwined, as Alida said, very beautiful through Kafka's reading and interpretations. What is the new urgency from the point of view of those thinkers in this Jewish Christian supersessionist conversation? One is the emergence of the centralized state and its law and its sovereign. Now, it's no more just the ritual law of the scripture, but law becomes, and I think Vivian points beautifully to that moment where this is transformed. Law now becomes not only ritual, obedience, legalistic, whatever negative terms that were ascribed to Jewish halacha, it becomes now the oppressive machinery of the sovereign, centralized, modern state, compounded with the Foucauldian new understanding of modernity as a realm of discipline, regulating highly disciplined sphere of regulated biopolitics sphere. So the problem of law now is inserted in a new urgency which is, I mean, I don't share the aversion to the modern state and, and the social democratic state. I don't think it's Auschwitz 
to be in a social democratic state, etc. I mean, they're different philosophers. They're, they're what you call the, the adolescent philosophers. This is Nietzsche. The macho philosophers. This is Heidegger and Schmidt. And they're the infantile philosopher. This is Agambe. You know, to sit, to sit at a ten-year-old somewhere and complain that you're imprisoned by language. I mean, it's, but in any event, in any event, I'm just saying that the problem of law has gained a new urgency for this thinker. The problem of universalism is also gained a new urgency that has to do with the emergence of nationalism and the understanding as of identity and particular entrenched identity as, as the root of modern bloodshed and evil. So the, the, the old debate has taken new urgency. Now Judaism has become a problem of modernity. I mean, the old style Judaism, it's both law representing the oppressive modern state, and it's also particularism representing all that is worse about the crimes of the 20th century. Now you compound with it Zionism, and then that's the worst, right? You read them and you think, if you just get of, read of Zionism, you're going to have a whole cosmopolitan bar mitzvah all <laughs> over the world. This is the only obstacle to cosmopolitan heaven. So you have now new urgencies that are in, in, injected into the supersessionist conversation by these thinkers. But there is as well, and that's, I think, something very fascinating. There is as well a new intellectual term that presents this debate as if an interpretation of a genuine Jewish move. So Agamben, in its anti-legal, legalistic term, is very influenced by Scholem as a pure representative of Judaism after all, didn't Scholem teach us that the ultimate aim of Judaism in, the, in his teleology of Kabbalah is the nihilistic undermining of the law through those imminent forces of Jewish life? That's one thing. So you have now a, a kind of a, a very interesting, I would say, mask almost to that supersessionist discussion. By the way, Taubes also plays a particular interesting role in baptizing Paul is a Jewish thinker, but that's a different issue. I don't want to get into that. But there is an interesting turn here, because now you can talk Jewishly in an antinomian terms. After all, the great Cholem taught us that this is, te teleologically speaking, the heart of Judaism. When we come to the universal, then actually the true Jewishness, and this is the elevation of exile as the ultimate condition of the Jew, is not about rootedness. It's about multiple identities, hybridity. And in Judith Butler term, it's about also not arriving. Exile is a not arriving term. I was thinking about my grandparents in the shtetl who were killed. They weren't social critics and cosmopolitan hybrid identities, this is, uh, or they, they didn't define themselves in state of not arrival. I mean, the exile, I think one of the deepest points in this book is actually show how, showing how exile is metaphorized into this uh, realm of, you know, it's from the point of view of Judith Butler, I'm, I'm getting a little bit polemic, so I'm sorry. It's, cosmopolitanism is a nice thing when you have both tenure and an American passport. <laughs> That's a nice thing to have. But, uh, but uh, and then you can stay that you're in a state of non-arrival. So I think what, what's happening here, and I think this is what I find important in the book, and there is an edge to the book. I mean, it's subtle. It's subtle. It's carefully argued. 
it's balanced, but there is an edge, an edge that comes with the pore that, if I want to use Benjamin's term, the pore that Vivian raises <laughs> from her own particular uh, stance against this Paulinian term. I want to say, I think one of the finest moments in the book, and again, there are so many fine moments, is the moment of the discussion of Agamben's reading of Before the Law and Benjamin Scholem discussion of this issue. And here I want to, in terms of contribution to the understanding of the experience of the law, right? I mean, they're, they're very hard to find canonical Jewish theological texts. But Ozenzweig was right that the Siddur is one of them. If there is one canonical Jewish text, it's the Siddur. There is one particular blessing that I'm always thinking about in the Siddur. It's the blessing right before Kriyat Shema that talks about love. It's a Christian theme in the Siddur. Eternal love, you have loved your people of Israel. Torah and commandments, decrees and laws, you have taught us. Right? Right? This is why we will uh, 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 delight in, in dwelling and thinking and learning your law. And then it ends with you should not, your love should never depart from us. The relationship between love and law, right? If this is a kind of a anti-Paulinian blessing, the law is not a curse, the law is a gift, the ultimate gift the ultimate divine gift. And what's missing, I mean, there's so many, this is an entry into a very deep conversation. In some ways, the ultimate conversation in this discussion. There are moments here in the book that touch upon that. And the movement from perceiving the law, halacha, <coughs> in the guise of modern sovereign biopolitical project of the state. And the way, the distorted perception of this idea. Why is the law perceived as an act of love in the Jewish tradition? Why is it the ultimate form of the gift of the law? We are not cursed by the law. Because, and here's Something that Vivian alludes to, what, when you read Paul, he's missing one category, which is repentance. He lacks the category of repentance. And therefore, the ultimate answer to failure in withstanding the law is the abrogation of the law towards grace, not repentance. And we know how beloved repentance is. There is another element, which is, and I think it comes very beautifully in Vivian's work. It's the way in which this legal tradition, this halachic tradition, this tradition that has to be superseded in the name of Paul, under the mask of the Judaized, nihilistic, Sholemian approval. This tradition is very aware of the perversions of the law. And here, that's one fascinating thing. I'm entering a conversation now with Steve. The outsider Binyam, though he's an outsider, got it much better than Sholem in, 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 uh, 
in picking something deep about the Jewish experience, right? And its attachment to the law and its realization that this is a tradition that has inbuilt in that tradition itself understanding or mechanisms of confronting the perversions of the law. So there are many things to say about this book. I'm just picking up on, as Steve said about reader, writers that are autobiographical, readers are also autobiographical. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is a moment, we talked about the gift of the law and the gift of love of the law. This is a moment also to thank you for the gift of that book, which I find a, a very deep, interesting contribution to modern Jewish thought. So thank you very much. Thank you.